So hi, welcome everyone. My name is Lydia and this is uh, Ralph. Hello. Uh, hey. <laughs> and Nuria, most of you already know because you had the tutorial um, with her just now. And so we'll be teaching you this course on advanced topics in quantum information theory. So what's this course about? We assume that you took some quantum lecture before. It could have been quantum mechanics one or one and two. It could have been the QIP course or the quantum physics for non-physicists or just the quantum information theory course. So you're familiar with concepts like quantum states, Dirac notation, Schrodinger equation, and density matrices and trace and partial trace. And if you're not familiar or not too familiar with this, then uh, you have this week and the next week to practice. Um, both the exercise in the tutorial and the lecture notes. So we assume that you know some basics of quantum mechanics, um, but maybe not many uh, implications, or you want to know more about what's done in current research be beyond quantum computing. So that's what we do in this course. We'll cover a few topics uh, related to kind of foundational aspects of quantum mechanics that are still open areas of research. Okay, so in all these four, um, big blocks there's many active groups doing research in this and it's a very nice topic for example for a phd okay so ralph will take care of the first two um topics which are thermodynamics quantum thermodynamics and then kind of related to this the idea of uh, making the smallest clocks possible so quantum clocks and control and he'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment. So, and this takes more or less until Easter or the week after Easter. And after that, I will take over. And uh, with me, we'll do more about aspects of logic and quantum mechanics. So we'll find some quantum paradoxes. We'll see how to find a general framework to, um, to convey all these things, um, how we address quantum logic. And, and in the last um, block, this is axiomatic approaches to quantum mechanics, meaning trying to find the quantum equivalent of, I don't know, Newton's laws. Newton's laws are something very intuitive, you know, like inertia or the back reaction, and don't have to do with a specific formalism, whereas the quantum formalism you given like states are vectors in Hilbert spaces, evolution is given by unitary operator, it's very mathematical and it doesn't have much physics in it. So these axiomatic approaches to quantum mechanics are what people are trying to do to try to derive quantum mechanics from a range of theories based on some simple um, principles. Okay. So this is kind of the plan for, for the lecture. There'll be lecture notes. So if you go on Moodle, we already have the lecture notes for the first one, two lectures, and we'll be uploading them um, as the semester goes. So it will not always be exactly ready before the lecture. Sometimes it will be maybe a day after or so. The lectures are here and then they'll be uploaded on our YouTube channel and you have all the links on Moodle. On Moodle. Um, and we'll try not to show students' faces or say your names on during the lecture so that it's not uh, on YouTube. Okay. Uh, so if you have questions during the lecture, you should ask, for example, using the chat, but because the chat is not perfect, like we, as much as we want, we're not always paying attention to it, and sometimes you might miss a question. So you can also uh, ask out loud. You're very welcome to. Okay. Think that if you have a question, and right now we don't have the option to ask the person sitting next to you, but it's very likely that many other people have the same question. So please ask. Okay. Uh, what else do I have to say? The tutorials, you already know the protocol. So the um, exercise sheet will be available uh, a day before or two days before the tutorial. And then there, Nuria goes through the, the main ideas of this problem sheet. And then the solution will be posted in the beginning of the week after. And you're, you know, you're encouraged to solve it by yourself, but you're also encouraged to check the solutions by yourself and, and then ask questions if something is still not clear, but you don't have to, to give us the, the solutions. Right. So, I think this is most of the logistics that I had here prepared. Do you, Ralph or Nuria, have anything to add to this logistics wise? Are the office hours on? Yes, and we have office hours uh, on Thursday. 
So maybe the first couple of weeks we'll, we'll be there on Zoom. And then after this, we'll see like, if many students come by, then we'll always have it open. If not, um, then we'll just set up a scheme where you sign up by email beforehand. Okay, but this is kind of the block. And if this block is not good for you, then please let us know, you can write on Moodle. So in general, there's two forums on Moodle. One is for questions about lecture, logistics, everything. And the other one is specific to exercise sheets. And the difference is just that Nuria checks the exercise sheets one then, and Ralph and I check the other one. Uh, okay. So do you have any questions about logistics? Of course, nothing that I can see. Okay, so then I will pass it on to Rolf, who will start with quantum thermodynamics. Thanks. All right, let me set up to make sure it's recording properly. Uh, good. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, Hi, Ashwin. Will there be an oral exam or a written one? Uh, as far as I know, it's an oral exam. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. I yes. Think so. yes. Okay. Yeah. Which, which by the way, yeah. probably, I mean, depending on the rules, we don't know yet if it will be in person or remote, but we'll see. Um, yes. Thanks very much, Lydia, for uh, introducing all of the logistics. Um, yes. So, I will start with quantum thermodynamics. And uh, I also wanted to say, encourage people to use uh, the office hours uh, for, for two reasons. One is because the course that I will teach is pretty much designed around the tools and um, concepts that I use for my own personal research. So I'm quite happy to talk about them. Um, also because thermodynamics in particular, I find is a topic that Every time you learn something new, it sort of teaches you about all of the things that you knew before or you thought you knew before you learned something more about them. It's not very much of a linear field in which you understand one thing completely before you go to the next thing. So it's quite nice to have discussions on the concepts repeatedly. Um, okay, in thermodynamics, uh, just to give you a brief overview, the approach that I will take is to build it from very much the behavior or the thermodynamic properties of the smallest possible uh, systems. So qubits and qutrits, two-dimensional, three-dimensional systems. And the reason for this is because it is actually the fact that for higher dimensional systems, you can understand the thermodynamic properties in terms of the smallest building blocks. And so I will introduce the concepts of energy and of entropy, which are the most important concepts in thermodynamics, then talk about temperature and how this exhibits on qubit systems, which are the simplest. And then the hope is once we do enough of these concepts and building blocks, we will be able to then do a couple of lectures where we're able to describe a lot of the field of quantum thermodynamics just in terms of these building blocks. Okay, good notes is working, very good. So to start off with, um, I'm going to focus on energy because this is at the heart of thermodynamics. Every thermal machine that we talk about involves the transport or exchange of energy between systems. Um, yes, so to begin with, we know that if we have a system, and this is now a review of quantum mechanics, I can write the state of the system as either pure state, which is psi, belonging to the Hilbert space of the system. So this is a vector or as if I do not know, if I have partial information on the system, I can write it as a mixture of pure states, which is described as a density matrix row. Which typically can be written as a mixture over a set of pure states. So here, PI are probabilities. So they sum up to one. And each of these psi i are projectors on the subspace spanned by psi i. And this is um, here, this, these psi i, 
the set is an orthonormal basis for the Hilbert space, for the Hilbert space of the system, right? So one of the properties of the density matrix being a positive operator is that we can always find a property distribution and an orthonormal basis such that this expression here can be, can be written down. But at the same time, we can also go in another direction. We can just pick a basis by which I mean an orthonormal basis. And let's call this um, VI, for instance. And we can express the density matrix in terms of this orthonormal basis. This would be IJ, rho IJ, VI, VJ. And the way to see this is the following. I can always write the density matrix multiplying it by identity operators because these don't, well, they don't have any effect. And what we should know from the tutorial and from quantum information uh, theory course or quantum mechanics course is that I can expand the identity in with this, by using the spectral theorem. And this gives me that the identity is just the sum, an equal sum of all of the projectors. And I do this for both of the, both of the identity operators. And the result then is that these three become a single coefficient, vi rho vj. The sums can be interchanged because these are all finite sums. And I'm left then with an operator vi vj. So this is the, the density matrix element corresponding to this operator here. Um, and the reason it's called a density matrix is because indeed, instead of writing it in Dirac notation, we can also write the set rho ij as a matrix where the rows are indicated by i and the column has the index j. So this is, this is now the matrix row not not, row one one, so on and so forth, row not one, row not two, row one not, row one two, and so on. Right, so um, yes. If I do find the, the basis in which uh, I can write it just as a mixture of pure states, then in that basis, of course, rho will look diagonal. So I can write this density matrix in the form rho not not, rho one one, dot dot dot, and then just zero everywhere else. Okay. So the diagonalization property says that for a density matrix, I can always find a basis in which it is diagonal, but I can also go the other direction and pick a basis and simply write the density matrix in this basis. So as I said, energy is the most important quantity in thermodynamics. So what we are going to do is we are going to focus on the energy eigenbasis. So for a system S, typically I have the Hamiltonian of the system that tells me its energy properties and its time evolution. And by the spectral decomposition, I can always write this as a sum of energy eigenvalues multiplied by the projectors on the eigenstates of energy. So these are eigenstates and these are eigenvalues. Right. Um, yes, we are going to use um, ordering for the energy. So whenever I express the Hamiltonian of a system, it's just nice to express it in such a way that the lowest eigenvalue is E naught, and then we order it in increasing order, E2 dot, dot, dot. Um, the reason that we can have equality uh, is because it is possible, um, it is possible to have a single, eigenvalue that has many eigenstates. So effectively, this is to say you can have many energy levels in a system that have the same energy, kind of like in the hydrogen atom, for example, that you can have multiple, for a fixed N, you can have multiple orbitals that have the same energy. Um, 
Yes, so otherwise it's monotonically increasing energy in energy. Okay, so we can always write rho in this basis. So now following the notation of the previous slide, I have a rho mn, em, en. And this is not necessarily a diagonal, but the fact that we can always do this is, is important, uh, important to us. And there is now a bit of terminology that I will introduce and explain. So the diagonal elements rho nn, I will call populations. And typically I will refer to them as a single pn. And the reason is that essentially they give you the probability that you are in a particular energy level, which if you have an ensemble of many states, this somehow gives you the number of states, the fraction of those systems that if you make an energy measurement, you will find in the energy level En. The off diagonal elements rho Mn, where um, M is not equal to N and Em is not equal to En. So these are the off diagonal elements between energy levels that are different in energy. So they do not share the same energy eigenvalue. These we will call coherences. Um, and sometimes this is interchangeable because in, in research, people call them, also call them phases, which will be explained uh, shortly. And so then if I have a state rho such that um, all the coherences are zero, I call this an incoherent, an incoherent state. And in addition, if rho is such that um, for a choice of the energy eigenstates, it's diagonal, then I just call it a diagonal state. Now, the reason these are different is particularly because um, of the condition here that I, I, I call stuff coherences only if it's an off-diagonal term with different possible for me to have a density matrix that is incoherent, but that is not diagonal because it has off-diagonal elements between energy eigenstates of the same eigenvalue. Um, okay, are there any questions at this point? Just want to check the chat, none so far, if there is, Please ask. No, all right, so I'll continue. Okay, the reason why we differentiate between incoherent and coherent states, and now this is a bit of a diversion and sort of a prelude to some of the things we will discuss when we discuss clocks is for the following reason. So we know from, oops, sorry, we know from Schrodinger evolution of quantum states that if I have an energy eigenstate En, and I time evolve it with time t, then what En becomes is it adds a phase e to the minus i En t. I should divide by h bar, but I'm, I never really need h bar, so I'm just going to use units h bar is equal to one throughout. Sorry, I forgot to say, <laughs> it's a phase e, e to the minus i En t times En. Um, and this is important because it means that if En goes to this, then if I have the dual, which is the bra, let's say En, this of course goes to En e to the plus I ENT. That's just the conjugate of the first line. So if I start with a row, a density matrix that is of this form, well, every density matrix is of this form, like in my last slide, then this is row t is equal to zero then rho at a general time t is going to add phases. Because of the em, it has a e to the minus i emt, em, en, and because of the other state, it has plus i ent, which is some mm, some mn rho mn um, e to the minus i en minus em, T, E, M, E, M. And now this is why the terminology in the previous slide, because if M is equal to N, 
which is the, the elements row n, n, there is no phase because this, this term here vanishes. The same way, if m is not equal to n and em is equal to en, also there is no phase. So the only time there is a phase that is evolving in time is particularly for those cases of off diagonal elements that have different energy eigenvalues. And this is important because if we consider that we are going to do anything with this density matrix, we're going to perform an operation on it to change it into something else that we want, it is quite, it is necessary, at least for some operations, to keep track of what this phase is. And I will use a simple example to demonstrate this here. So imagine that we had the following uh, Hilbert space, which is one that you should be used to. Um, sorry, it's just, it's the span of just two states, zero and one. So this is a qubit. And my Hamiltonian of the system is just E times the projector on the state one, one. So it's essentially a qubit and the energy gap between the ground and the excited state is just E. Then if I start with the state, psi initial is zero plus one over square root of two, this in time becomes zero plus e to the minus i e t one over square root of two. So imagine the following scenario. I know that my state has started out in this psi initial, which you will recognize as the plus state. And I want to perform the following operation on it. Um, and this is a unitary operation, which we will discuss more in time. But imagine that my unitary operation is simply the following. If the state is plus, I want it to transform into zero. And if the state is minus, I want to transform it into one. And the reason I choose this unitary is because I want the final state to be zero. So I, I want that the final state of the system to be the state zero. The problem is that if I apply u on psi at a time t, this is not equal to the state zero. In fact, if I pick t to be, let's say, pi over e, then psi t is zero plus e to the minus i pi uh, one over square root of two, which is zero minus one over square root of two, which is, as you know, the state minus. And therefore, if I apply the unitary now on this state, on minus, I'm going to end up with the state one, which is in fact orthogonal to the state that I want it to be, which is zero. So this is a very simple demonstration um, to point out that, ah, actually, uh, just a small uh, remark now, because I, I forgot to say this at the beginning, Everybody should be able to see the bottom of the screen uh, that I, on which I'm writing. If you cannot, you should go to the view options on the top of your screen. And instead of choosing fit to window, you should choose fit to 100%, which is the original size. And then the entirety of my iPad screen should fit on your screen. So if anybody is finding that the bottom of my page is not visible, please adjust. I hope this has not been the case so far. Right, so yes, so as I was saying, if, if, we, if we apply the unitary at the wrong time, we're going to end up with a different state than what we like. In fact, we can end up with an even an orthogonal state to what we were planning to get, which proves that if we have phases that are evolving in time, we need to keep track of those phases in order to be able to do the general operation that we like. And so this gives us now two options to proceed. The first option is the one of clocks which is to keep track of the phases. Um, but of course, in order to keep track of the phases, we have to have ourselves a system which itself is time evolving, which is exactly what a clock is. It's a system with a physical degree of freedom that changes in time. And that allows us to tell how much time has passed on another system, for example. And this is not trivial in finite dimensional quantum thermodynamics because this itself is a resource. And it is quite possible sometimes to cheat thermodynamically by allowing ourselves an unbounded resource in terms of clocks and coherences. So this is one thing which we will discuss in further detail later. 
But the other option to go is to not keep track of the phases. And what this leads is to sort of a time, time average, which leads to incoherent thermodynamics. And what I mean is the following. So imagine now that I wrote uh, the state of rho of the qubit that I had in the, in the last slide. The initial state would be, it's a superposition of zero and one. So it will be this state, one, 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 and half. This is basically the same as half times, uh, yes, zero plus one, zero plus one, which is psi psi, where psi was the initial state. But rho at time t is going to have the phases. This is going to have e to the plus i t. I hope I've not mixed up the plus and minus, but that doesn't really matter for the, the point I'm about to make. If it does, then we just flip e to minus e. Um, right. And now imagine that I'm going to do something on the state. I'm going to do a transformation or perhaps I'm going to do a measurement. So for example, if I do a measurement, we know that the, the probabilities, or let's say, imagine that I'm, I'm gonna have an expectation value. Oops, sorry. I'm going to calculate the expectation value of A on the state rho. This is given by the trace of rho times the operator A. And so in our case, this will be trace of rho, time, uh, rho at the time T times the operator A. However, because I do not know what the time t is, what effectively I have to say is that if I have a, an ensemble of density matrices all corresponding to rho t, which is how I calculate the expectation value, I, I measure each one of these and then I, I join together statistics. In each case, I have to consider that I'm hitting the state rho at a different time t. And so the end result is that the statistics I get will, corresponding, will correspond to averaging out this time. So what I will have is my effective rho is this time average. And there are many ways to calculate this time average, but for example, I can say, imagine that I just take from zero to T what rho is, I divide it over T, but I don't know what this, this capital T can also be anything. So I just take, I think the limit T tends to infinity to, not, to ensure that the choice of T is not actually affecting what this average is, because that would also be a measurement of time. And this, what this does is it sets all, phases to zero, simply because the time average of e to the minus i anything times t, where this is a, a real number. My, my row average t is now given by half one, zero, zero, one, which is in fact just a mixture of the states zero and one. And in this case, it's also the identity operator divided by two. So this is the reason why incoherent states where all the coherences are set to zero are important thermodynamics, not because these are the only states that we have existing in thermodynamics, but because depending on whether we have access to keeping track of time and coherent resources or not, we effectively have to say, no matter what state we have, the only thing we can really operate on, given our knowledge of the scenario, is actually the dephased state, the incoherent state. So dephasing is setting coherences to zero. Oh. Right. Um, Yes, and a big part of the first, well, essentially the first part of this course uh, until we get to the, the point at which we actually discuss clocks will mainly be on incoherent thermodynamics where we will not actually be doing things that deal with coherences between different energy eigenstates. Okay, um, right, are there any questions at this point? What is the time? I think 14. And don't seem to be any okay so oh yes um, i guess so the this um, time average do we, do we justify it 
theater in that sense that it's like a reali realistic approach? Or? Um, aha, do you mean that it's, well, okay, no, I would, okay. So I would hope that the justification is actually clear now. So then maybe I repeat it a bit. If we do not know how much time has passed from a point at which we did know what the state was with all of its coherences, then we have to assume that the time at which we measure is a random time. And so this, um, essentially this time average that I just took here encodes the fact that I, I don't know how long, essentially here, I, I don't know how long I've had the state for. And so the only assumption that I can make is that the state is, um, the state is an average over these. I guess what I should also add, which, which I have said here is, is that the expectation value, essentially everything that we do on density matrices, the probabilities, the expectation values, they're all linear functions of the density matrix. So if I take a linear function on something that has random times, I can, um, I can also, I can hit these two things commute, a linear average of, if I take a random um, time and then take a linear average, I can also do the same as saying, I take a linear average on something that has been randomized with respect to time. Okay. And so this is why it works. It's because quantum mechanics, all of the objects and effects in quantum mechanics are linear. Yes. Okay, thank you. I have a question. question about the difference between the diagonal state and the incoherent state. Um, yes. Yeah, I, I, I missed what's, what's exactly the difference there. Aha, uh -huh. so the difference is that, um, so let, okay, let me give you a small example as you make it clear. Imagine that the Hamiltonian of the system was uh, given by, let's say zero times, so the ground state has zero energy plus E dot one plus the same E for two. So this is the matrix zero E, E. So now we have a degenerate space um, between the, the eigenstates one and the eigenstate two. And so if I have rho of this form, so it has rho zero, 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 zero rho one, one, rho two, two, rho one, two, rho two, one. This is incoherent, but not diagonal with respect to the basis in which I'm currently working. And the reason is because the only, only off diagonal elements are between uh, equal, between energy eigenstates of equal energy. And the reason is that if I now time evolve this, it's going to be the same as t equals zero because these, these, um, these matrix elements, they will add a phase of e to the minus i e2 or e to the plus i in this case, I think e2 minus e1 times t but because E2 and E1 are the same here, that's just equal to one. And this is, this, is, uh, this is an example of an incoherent state that's not diagonal. What I should add is that if you have an incoherent state that is not diagonal, you can always convert it into a diagonal state in energy by just choosing a different uh, basis for uh, the energy eigenstates one and two. And this is something that can be, that would be done, uh, I think in a tutorial, but essentially it corresponds to, um, taking this sub matrix and diagonalizing it, which will lead to two new energy eigenstates that because they, the original energy eigenstates share the same eigenvalue, the new one will also have the same eigenvalue and you will have a diagonal state. So diagonal is really in this case, just um, a question of picking the energy basis that we, we want and having the state be absolutely diagonal without even coherent, without even off diagonal elements between the same energy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so to proceed now, I will talk a little bit about unitary operations. Um, because of course, the only way we can discuss any sort of thermodynamics is if we actually transform a system in some fashion. Um, and so the simplest way of transforming a system we know is if we take psi, and we take it to u psi, where u is an operator such that u dagger u is the identity operator, which is the same as saying u inverse is equal to u dagger. So this is a unitary operator, which I think, uh, yes, you did definitely covered also a little bit in the tutorial today. 
Um, now, the unitary operator is not the most general transformation you can make on a system. Um, U is, so is not most general. What is more general than that is the, the concept of a CPTP map on a system where CP refers to it being completely positive and TP refers to it being trace preserving. I don't know whether you have already been introduced to this. Uh, suffice to say at this moment that a CPTP map on rho, you can always write in the form of the sum of a K, AK rho, AK dagger, where the AK are normalized in this fashion, AK dagger, AK should sum up to the identity. Um, and so immediately you see that uh, the unitary operator is a special case. If, if instead of having a, a whole sum of a AK, if I just have a single, I don't have the sum and I just have a single AK, which satisfies of course that AK dagger AK is identity, that turns out to be a unitary. So a unitary is a special type of a CPTP map, but it is more specific. Um, and the reason the unitary is special among maps is, well, there are a number of reasons, but of particular physical significance is that given a unitary operator, it always has the property that U can be written as E to the, um, well, let's say I A for some, permission A, which is something you'd have done in the tutorial. And what this implies, this e to, e to the IA is exactly the same as of the form that we are used to is E to the minus IHT, which is the evolution operator. So what this implies is that if I have a unitary that I want to perform on the system, all I have to do is to find A such that E to the IA is actually U and then apply it as a Hamiltonian on the system and once I do that, I will be able to affect the unitary operation that I'm trying to, to get. Um, so one example of this is the following. Imagine that I wanted to, returning to the case of a qubit, I wanted to apply the unitary that's the same as the, sometimes it's called the X operator, sometimes it's called the Pauli X operator, which is the following matrix, zero, one, one, zero. That is essentially a flip in the computational basis. It takes zero to one and one to zero. Um, this we, uh, we know from, let's say the blocks, let's draw a block sphere here. So if this is the block sphere, oh, haha, that doesn't work so well. Um, where this is the Z axis, this is the X axis, and that's the Y axis. So this pole of the block sphere is the state zero. This pole of the block sphere is the state one. This operator is essentially the one that flips zero to one and back. And we know uh, that in order to flip the Z axis so that it goes to minus Z, all we have to do is to rotate about the equator by the amount pi. Yes, exactly, to rotate about, about the equator around about the amount pi. So for example, a rotation around the X axis by 180 degrees or pi, will do this, a rotation on the y-axis will do this, any rotation on the equator will do this. And the way to check that is to see that if you take the operator A to be some linear combination, AX sigma X plus AY sigma Y, you can find a T, there exists a T such that E to the minus I A T is going to be equal to, well, the operator that we're looking for. And this is a little exercise that you can do um, depending on AX and AY, T is going to have pi in it. It's, I think with pi divided by the, the mod, modulus of AX squared plus AY squared, something like this. Um, but yeah, the, the main thing to take from this is that any unitary can be applied by finding the proper operator that can serve as a Hamiltonian and then just turning on this Hamiltonian on the system and turning it off at a particular time such that your unitary operator has been applied. So that is one useful property of the unitary. Um, the other properties of the unitary that are important is that U, oh, sorry, still on the, so U preserves the von Neumann entropy, which we will not discuss in detail the entropy currently, that will be 
introduce in a later lecture. But for now, let's just define it. I think everyone who's been in the QIT course, of course, will be very used to this quantity. It's minus trace of rho log rho. Um, U preserves this, and it's very simple to see because if you add U and U dagger here, and U and U dagger, you can consider the diagonal basis for rho, and, and you can see that it, in fact, um, the, the expression remains the same due to the cyclicity of the trace. So that's one of the important things. And the other useful thing to remember is that U can always be written as um, a change of basis. So it can be written as sum over i of vi ui, and where each of these are orthonormal, orthonormal bases. Um, the reason this is important is because very often in thermodynamics, when we are searching for the best possible unitary operation to do something that we want, um, or the optimal one, uh, it's much easier to think of the question let me take my initial set of states, typically my energy eigenstates, and let me see, well, which, which of these energy eigenstates do I want to go into which other energy eigenstates? And that, in that sense, once I find the beginning and the final list, that immediately gives me the unitary operator that I'm looking for. So this is a very useful thing to keep in mind and, and think of. Okay, so that is, yes, that's all I wanted to say at the moment about unitary operators. Well, there is one more thing to add. Uh, is there any question at the moment? Okay, so um, now I'm going to return back, join the concept of unitary operators with the concept of energy. And so we're going to talk now about average energy and energy preserving unitaries. Also, alternatively, they're called energy conserving Unitaries. You will find both of these terms in the literature. Um, right. So, what is the average energy? We will refer to it typically as E average. This is just as you would expect the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. Now, because we write the state, uh, the density matrix in terms of the energy eigenbases, what you can check is that this um, expression, which is the trace of rho times h, simplifies to the sum of the populations Pn that we define to be the diagonal elements of the density matrix in the energy eigenbases times the energy eigenvalues. So this is the reason why looking at the energy eigenbases and the diagonal elements is useful. This is just now a linear combination of the energy eigenvalues. Um, right, so one of the important questions that one can ask in thermodynamics is how does the average energy change when we make an operation? So consider that I perform a unitary rho so that the initial, sorry, a unitary u so that the initial state rho goes to u rho u dagger. So my final um, average energy, E average prime, um, and this is a good time to say that I'm, typically the simplest way I will uh, indicate that the initial and a final state is by just using prime for what, has, what the transform state or transform variable is. This is going to be the trace of rho prime h, which is trace of u rho u dagger h, which to be fair, I can also write it as due to cyclicity, trace of u dagger h u. And so now this is now in general, not equal to my initial E average. However, there, is, there are some cases in which it is equal to, and one of those cases is important. Imagine that U commuted with the Hamiltonian of the system. So U H, oh, sorry, H minus H U is equal to zero. This is what we call an energy preserving U. And in this case, you see immediately what happens in this case here, this expression becomes, well, trace of rho u dagger, and we can switch h and u around because it commutes. But of course, u dagger u is identity because it's a unitary operation. So this is now just trace of h rho, which is my original energy uh, E average. 
So clearly a unit tree that commutes with the Hamiltonian will also preserve the average energy. However, a unit tree that commutes with the Hamiltonian does more than that. What it means, and this is something that you would have done in the tutorial is that U and H are simultaneously diagonalizable up to, well, let's say not diagonalizable, but rather block diagonalizable. So if I have a basis in which I write the Hamiltonian and it's diagonal, I'm guaranteed that I can also write the unitary in that same basis and it will be block diagonal, meaning that the only place it will not be diagonal is where there are energy eigenvalues that are the same. Effectively, what this means is that U is always of this form in places where the energy eigenvalue is unique, it's just going to be of that form, but then at some point it can be more complicated. So let's write it like this. And then they're just zeros here and zeros here. So for all of the cases in which there's this energy eigenvalue that is alone, so E0, E1, En, they're all different. The, the only thing that the unitary can do is just add a in, in the case that there is a degenerate subspace, which is a subspace where there are energy eigenvalues, where there's a single energy eigenvalue that is shared in that subspace, V can, that sub block V can be a, as general unitary operation as you like. So in, the, in that block V dagger V will be identity, let's say on that, subspace, right? And another way of saying this is that the only non-trivial action of a energy preserving unitary is to do things among degenerate states and leave everything else the same. All right, um, at this point, I think uh, we should take a break of, let's say, well, 10 minutes or, okay, it's 16.32 now, let's, reconvene at 1640. Um, I will continue by talking about virtual qubits. Uh, at this point, I will simply refresh myself with a glass of water and then return to answer questions that you may have until uh, 440 or 1640, at which point we will continue. All right, see you soon. I have also another question. Yes, go on. Um, so um, the last thing that you wrote uh, about mm -hmm. the unitary that preserves the energy, mm -hmm. um, we are considering the Hamiltonian to be the Hamiltonian of the system. And then the unitary should it be the exponential of the Hamiltonian itself. So it trivially ah. moves with it. Uh -huh. Okay, yes, sorry. So this is, um, so this is a good point. Um, a unitary operator does not so of course there is the unitary operator that corresponds to the Hamiltonian of the system itself, just the time evolution of that. And that by definition commutes because the exponent of a matrix commutes with the matrix itself. But the more interesting thing is when the unitary is, is an, in a, a unitary essentially that is applied externally, which means that we turn on another Hamiltonian for a short amount of time and turn it off so that there's a transformation on the system by a Hamiltonian that is not the same as the Hamiltonian of the system itself. So when I talk about unitaries being energy preserving here, the assumption is that they are not the trivial Hamiltonian U is the exponent of the Hamiltonian of the system itself. And this, this is why um, when I was talking about the fact that uh, a unitary operator can be written in a, as an exponential of a Hamiltonian, I particularly used A instead of H because um, this is to say that A need not be equal to the Hamiltonian of the system in general. So it doesn't have to be the Hamiltonian of the system. There is a slight subtlety here, which is if you think about applying a Hamiltonian externally at the same time that the Hamiltonian of the system is also acting, then effectively this is actually much more complicated if that external Hamiltonian doesn't commute with your system Hamiltonian. Um, but it turns out that it, you can do it quite easily and you don't have to consider the, the exact time ordering if those two Hamiltonians commute, which is another way of saying that if the unitary commutes with the Hamiltonian, then you can also typically find 
um, an operator A, which also commutes to the Hamiltonian such that the unitary is the exponent of that Hamiltonian. So it's also to say that the, the interaction Hamiltonian that you need to turn on to apply the unitary also must have the property that it preserves the energy of your system. Or at least you can find uh, interaction Hamiltonian of that type. Okay, so in a way we are kind of neglecting the energy that um, from the outside we can kind of uh, insert or remove from our system. Well, when you take a unitary that commutes with the Hamiltonian of the system, what you are doing is you're effectively preventing there from being energy that you exchange either going outside or coming back inside because you preserve the average energy and more than the, the average energy, you preserve the populations in every subspace. You can shift around populations within degenerate subspaces, but you cannot actually change. You can actually cannot actually move population from one energy level to a different energy level, a level of different energy. So this is why energy preserving unitaries are quite restrictive. They preserve energy in every sense, average as well as the spectrum. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Now I see. Okay. Okay. Thank you a lot. Okay. So in fact, that, that provides a good way to continue, which is to say the um, to conclude, oh, to conclude what we sort of were doing last time, we see that E, oh, sorry. Energy preserving unitaries have that delta E is equal to zero and delta S is equal to zero. And these are effectively the two most important thermodynamic quantities. The first law is all about energy. The second law is typically all about entropy. So when you have a, a unitary that preserves energy, this is somehow um, almost a free operation in the sense that you know that you are not, you don't require a battery and you don't require a place to hide or to exchange information with, which is what entropy encodes effectively, which we will discuss the relationship between entropy and information more later, but suffi suffice to say that this is sort of the simplest thermodynamic operation. Okay, um, right. So now I'm going to continue with an extremely uh, intuitive building block of thermodynamics. Uh, let me start a bit lower, which is um, the concept of virtual qubits. Okay, so to start explaining what a virtual qubit is, we in fact start with a real qubit. So imagine now I have um, my Oops, sorry, as usual. And I have that the Hamiltonian is, I'm not going to use the subscript system if it's clear that I, there's just one system. Um, it's just given by E times one, one, which is of course the Hamiltonian zero, zero, zero E when expressed in the computational basis. Um, what I want to consider is the thermal state of such a Hamiltonian, which I expect you've done in the tutorial is defined as the exponent of the Hamiltonian divided by the trace of that. Um, there are a number of things to say. This is called a Gibbs state. It's also a thermal state, but we will see why it's a thermal state. This is just to ensure that it's, it's normalized, but this function um, is in fact quite important. It's called, it's called the partition function. And it's labeled, I will label it with a Z and with a strike through. And it's very important in thermodynamics because anybody who's studied classical thermodynamics will know that the partition function or these derivatives of it with respect to different variables actually give you a lot of the thermodynamic properties of a system. Um, right, and the last thing to say is this beta here is one over KT because typically Gibbs factors are E upon KT, but it's much, much simpler to have it as beta times the energy rather than uh, inverse thing. So this is called officially, this is the inverse temperature because it's the well, one over the temperature. Um, but I will use, I will almost exclusively use beta instead of T because it's much more convenient. So I'm not going to keep saying inverse temperature. I'm simply going to say temperature for beta and that will suffice. Um, important things to remember is that if T, T 
greater than zero means that beta greater than zero, t less than zero is beta less than zero. It's both ways, of course. And finally, t, t increasing implies that beta is decreasing. T decreasing implies that beta is increasing. So for example, absolute zero, which is the limit T goes to zero from the positive side is the same as beta going to plus infinity. So a system that is very, very cold is effectively one which beta is approaching is an unbounded quantity is approaching plus infinity. Okay, so um, let's, oh, right. Let's go this way. Uh, yes, yeah, so now let's see what this density matrix is. Tau is equal to this. Uh, I can very easily see that the exponent of beta times the Hamiltonian is equal to one, zero, zero, e to the minus beta e. So recall that when we have a diagonal matrix, then any analytic function of this diagonal matrix is simply applying the analytic function on each of its diagonal elements. So to take the exponent, I just take the exponent of zero and the exponent of e with the minus beta and I get this. And so this gives us that tau is now one upon one plus e to the minus beta e, that's the trace times this density matrix, which in Dirac notation is one upon one plus e to the minus beta e, the projector on zero, plus e to the minus beta e upon one plus e to the minus beta e, the projector on one. And the simplest way to extract the information about what temperature this state is, is by looking at the population. So remember now, this is the population P0 in the ground state. I forgot to say earlier that, um, well, two things I forgot to say, and that I should say now is that we always take E0 to be zero. And the reason, again, this was a problem in the tutorial is that you can always shift a Hamiltonian by a constant times the identity and the dynamics of your system doesn't change. It's just a global phase. And so for convenience, we can shift it so that the ground state is always at zero energy, which is exactly what I started off with here. And we always call E0 um, the ground state. And so the, the population corresponding to that is the ground state population. Anyway, so this element here is the ground state population um, together with the normalization, of course, I can't leave that up. And then of course, the, this element here is the excited state population. And if I look at the ratio P1 upon P0, I see that it is precisely E to the minus beta E. This is called a Gibbs ratio, and it is something that you will be able to speak about in your sleep by the end of a few lectures because we will return to it repeatedly. Um, yes, so one way of understanding the state from its populations is via the ratio. Another way of understanding it is via the bias of the state, which we can define as P0 minus P1, which if I look at it here, I will get one minus e to the minus beta e upon one plus e to the minus beta e, which if I multiply throughout by e to the minus beta e by two, I get this form, which you can already see are turning into the sine and the cos hyperbolic functions. So this is tan hyperbolic of beta e over two. So these are two ways of, of talking about the population and converting between the population and temperature. Okay, so, so far, what I've done is I've, I've started with beta and then I've gone to the state. But now I would like to consider what happens if I do the opposite direction. So if I give you, imagine that I just said, the state of a qubit is equal to the following. It's rho zero, or let's actually say P zero. P zero, 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 and P one. And of course we know that P one must be equal to one minus P zero in this case, because it's a real qubit, it's a normalized state. And I give you the guarantee that the state is incoherent of a diagonal in this case between the two different energy eigen, uh, eigenvalues. And I also tell you that, I tell you what the Hamiltonian is. So I say, 
h is equal to zero, zero, zero e. Then I can always use now the same formula of the Gibbs ratio to say, well, I can associate a temperature to this state. I simply have to take P1, take P0, find the ratio. I know what E is. And so I can solve the, the equation that is the Gibbs ratio to supply me with a beta, which means that we can also go in the opposite direction here. I can start with a state and I can define a beta off from that state. And what this is saying is that if I have a qubit that is diagonal in energy, I can always associate a temperature with it. So every diagonal state of energy of a qubit is a thermal state for some temperature beta. This does not apply to higher dimensional states because the reason it applies for qubits is because the only degree of freedom for a qubit effectively is just, I have to just pick the ground state energy, sorry, the ground state population. P1 is determined from the ground state population. And so there's one degree of freedom, which is exactly what we need, we get from this one equation. Um, if I have a Q trait, for example, this is not a guarantee that I can, I, I cannot find a single beta that will suffice to match all of the ratios. Um, right, however, because of the fact that every qubit can be associated with the temperature, what we are going to do is we're going to use that effectively to define a virtual qubit. So what a virtual qubit is, is a subspace within a larger system. So now imagine the following. I have um, a Hamiltonian HS, which is given by sum over EN, 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 as usual. And I give you a state rho that is of this form. So actually, let me write it even bigger. There is somewhere a diagonal element PK. There is somewhere a diagonal element PL. And, and then here there are zeros. Here there are zeros. Here there are zeros. Um, right, so it is a density matrix that is block diagonal with respect to the KL subspace. So what this means is that in the K row and the L row and the K column and the L column of the density matrix, there are no off diagonal elements. They're only the diagonal elements, which is also the same as saying that they're themselves. So of course there can be something, there, there can be a lot of stuff here that is not equal to zero, not equal to zero, not equal to zero but we don't care about that. We only focus on this qubit subspace. Um, this reminds me of something that I, I forgot to go over earlier, which is an energy level diagram. So I'm going to draw the energy level of diagram of this. Um, I can associate this Hamiltonian here with the following energy level diagram. So let's do that, 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 dot, dot, dot. This is E zero, this is some EM, EN, let's call this EK and EL. And what I'm doing in this part now is I'm focusing on the subspace of EK and EL. Um, the reason why energy level diagrams are kind of useful is that quite a lot of times, um, a lot, all, almost all of the information that is pertinent to a thermodynamic scenario can be put in terms of the energy level diagram without having to write everything in Dirac notation or having to write the full density matrix. But anyway, so imagine that I have now um, such a density matrix, then I can always do something that I did before. I can say, well, let me take the ratio between the population PK, sorry, PK and PL. And I write down the equation that I had before with the energy difference EL minus EK. And this, I label this by beta KL, 
This I can call now the virtual temperature of the KL virtual qubit. And so what this is to say is that in a general density matrix, there's no guarantee at all that it is thermal in any sense, but I can still isolate qubit subspaces and ask what sort of temperature does it look like that subspace has. And this is very important because those are the subspaces that are going to give us the good properties of thermodynamic machines eventually. Um, yes, so I am guaranteed that I can always solve this equation to get uh, a beta because as long as this is, as long as EL is not equal to EK, there's always going to be a beta that is going to give me back the, the ratio of temperatures because the ratio of temperatures is a general real number, but the exponent of beta times a real number can be anything if we vary beta from minus infinity to plus infinity. So, so in this sense, I can define a virtual temperature very easily. What I can also define, and these will be important, is I can define NV, V now really refers to the fact that I'm talking about virtual qubits, which is the norm of the virtual qubit, which is equal to PK plus PL. And this, this is important. I introduced it here. I did not introduce it before because for a real qubit, of course, PK plus PL must be one. All of the population has to be either in one state or the other. But for a virtual qubit, this is in general less or equal to one. And finally, I can introduce a bias of the virtual qubit, but this is not, we call this now the normalized bias. And the reason for calling it the normalized bias is because if I tried to use the same bias as the last time, which is the difference PK minus PL, this is a bit misleading because in the case of the, let me go back, sorry, where was I? Yes, in the case of a real qubit, when I looked at the bias P naught minus P1, the only way to change it really was to change the virtual temperature of the qubit. There was no way of changing, there was no way of changing the bias without changing the virtual temperature. Whereas here, I can change the difference between the populations and still keep the ratio the same. All I have to do is to decrease both of them by the same factor or increase both of them by the same factor by taking some population outside of both of them and putting them in another part of the density matrix. And this is a bit misleading because it's not like the temperature has changed. And because of this, what we define the normalized bias to be is actually the bias divided by the norm which is PK minus PL upon PK plus PL. And this we can verify, well, if I change it into this form, you see now it's going to have the same one minus upon one plus the Gibbs factor. And that as you can verify easily is again, tan hyperbolic of the virtual temperature times the energy gap upon Um, yes. So, yes. So to, to summarize, even in a density matrix that is not itself thermal, we can pick qubit subspaces as long as they are incoherent with respect to the rest of the density matrix and also incoherent in their own subspace. And on that qubit subspace, define a virtual temperature, a bias, and a norm. And this is the concept of virtual qubits. You can break down a bigger system into little virtual qubits. Uh, one of the immediate consistency checks that we can do is imagine that I actually gave you a thermal state of a large system. So imagine now I gave you tau of the system, which is e to the minus beta h upon well, the trace of the same, which is, I'll just use the partition function for the trace, uh, the sum over n e to the minus beta e n, e n, e n. So now if I take the ratio PL over PK, so I just pick randomly a pair of K and L, then what I find is that this is e to the minus beta EL upon Z divided by e to the minus beta EK upon Z, which in turn is simply e to the minus beta EL minus EK. And what this implies is that if I said, well, let me pick a pair of levels and ask what its virtual temperature is, this exactly matches um, 
this equation, which implies that in fact, our virtual temperature of that subspace is just the beta that define the thermal state, which makes sense. If I actually have a thermal state and I look at virtual qubits, every virtual qubit, qubit actually looks thermal at the same temperature as the global thermal state. The usefulness of course is that the virtual temperatures can be defined even when I don't have a thermal state. Um, okay, at this point I will pause a bit. Uh, does anybody have questions of any kind? Yes, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go on. Uh, uh, I just don't understand your diagram with energies. Aha, the energy level diagram. Yeah. Aha, uh -huh. so all, all that I have done is, so for an energy level diagram, let me add a page. Um, I simply, wh what I do is I simply start from the ground state mm -hmm. and every, every energy level essentially has a line segment. That's all it is. So every energy level, so for a qubit, it's just going to be, this is the state zero, this is the state one, and the distance between them is E. If, if the Hamiltonian HS is equal to, E times one, one. If for example, another example would be HS is equal to um, E one, one plus E two, two plus two E three, three, then this corresponds to the energy level, this, 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 and this. This is the state zero, this is the state one, this is the state two, and this is the state three, and the, the gap between each of them is E. Oh yeah, okay, okay. Uh, I, I thought the alignment was important in the uh -huh. other one. That's why I got yes, confused, right. but yeah, I see it now. Uh, indeed, yes, yes. So the, the fact that they were shifted to the left and right was just for convenience because I wanted to isolate uh -huh. E, L, and E, K, but that's that's not important at all, indeed, yeah. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah, but you're welcome, thanks for the question. It was good that you pointed out because what I wanted to say about um, these diagrams is that the useful thing about the diagrams is it's also nice for the, on these diagrams to write simple unitary operations. So for example, imagine in this case that I did the unitary operation that um, did nothing to two or to zero or to one. So it left zero or one the same, but it swapped the states two and three. So this is the unitary one, one, uh, zero, one, one, zero. Then I can, I can sort of write it as, you know, this operation here. And this is something that I can, that, that we will return to when we're designing simple machines, because very often it's all about, okay, the interaction that makes this machine work is for these two states to swap into each other. And that's very easy to write on energy level diagrams. So that's the usefulness somehow of them. Um, yes, any other questions? Okay. Um, right, in fact, I think, so wait, we are going until 5.30, uh, I guess. And so we have 20 minutes more. Okay, so I have time to actually go into something huh, that I didn't think I was gonna have time to go into today, which is the composition of virtual qubits. So, a little bit of um, explanation as to why this is important. One of the key parts of thermodynamics is that is the generation of new temperatures. And what I mean is the following. We know, we, or rather we have the intuition that if one has two temperatures, it is easy to generate temperatures in between. You simply mix the temperatures that you have and you can get something in between. So if I have an object which is sitting between um, a, a bath of or a hot bath that is at 100 degrees Celsius, and like, let's say, a bucket of boiling water, and another bucket which is full of ice at zero degrees Celsius, I expect that the, in, the object in between is going to have a temperature somewhere in the range between zero and 100. But this is not the point of thermal machines. If we take the refrigerator, for example, the manner in which the refrigerator runs is that I use a hot bath somewhere, I burn fuel to produce electricity, which is fed into my home. And that is used in conjunction with the room temperature bath, which is just our environment where we can dissipate heat. But the effect is to create a temperature inside of the refrigerator, which is less than both of the temperatures that we started off with. And this is the special property of thermodynamics, which in classical thermodynamics is not so simple to see with continuous variables, 
But in fact, with quantum thermodynamics, and as I will show with virtual qubits, there's a very easy way to understand this, which is the following. Um, we know, so we know that when we pick, so now, now I'm going to talk about multiple systems. So let's say, let's say I have systems A and B. I know that if I pick a thermal state of system A at beta, and I take the tensor product of this with the thermal state of system B at the same beta, then this is really the thermal state of the joint system at the same temperature beta, which is to say e to the minus beta h a upon z a tensor e to the minus beta h b upon z b is the same as e to the minus beta h a. So I'm going to write it as h a plus h b, but probably okay. Let me let me be more identity B, more thorough here, um, identity on A, tensor HB. This is the same as just adding them, which is exactly what the total Hamiltonian is, oops, sorry, tensor, plus identity on A, tensor HB, upon ZAB, and this is really HAB. By definition, because energy is an additive quantity, the total energy of two objects is the sum of the two energies. So the Hamiltonian is just the sum of the two Hamiltonians. But the interesting part happens when I take thermal state of A at some temperature and a thermal state of B at a different temperature. This is not equal to a thermal state of AB at some beta prime in general. So it's not the case that if I take two thermal states, it looks like the thermal state of something, let's say, in between. What I will find, and this is where the composition of virtual qubits comes into play, is that when I look at the joint state and I look at particular subspaces, I can find temperatures that are way outside the range of beta A and beta B. They need not be between beta A and beta B. OK, so to proceed, what we're going to do is actually look at this concept now, which is the composition of virtual qubits. So this is where the energy diagram also again comes into play. Um, so I'm going to write the Hamiltonian of A in terms of its energy level diagram. There are some particular energy levels. Then there's the Hamiltonian of B. I'm not paying attention to the spacing so much. So don't take it to be an equally spaced Hamiltonian. It's just uh, a thing. And tensor with this, and this is going to give me some joint Hamiltonian. Uh, it's very important to see the properties of this joint Hamiltonian. So let's, let's see what the eigenvalues and eigenvectors are. So imagine that I have um, the eigenstates En of A. So these are the eigenstates of HA. Uh, and then I have En or E, let's say, do, do, do. Em of B of HB, then it follows that En A tensor Em B is an eigenstate of HAB because this is, remember, the definition of HAB is just the sum of the local Hamiltonians. Oh, uh, sorry. identity on A, tensor the Hamiltonian on B. Um, and the way to prove it is very simple. Imagine that I act with this operator on this state. I will get that, oh, no. I will get that HAB acting on this state here is equal to, so I simply act, when I act on it with the first element, then that simply gives me the eigenvalue of A. And I act with the second element that simply gives me the eigenvalue of B. So I'm going to get E and A, that eigenvalue, plus E and B times the same state, E and A tensor E and B, which proves that this is an eigenstate because we have the eigenvalue equation 
the operator acting on the on the state gives us a number times the state. And it also shows that the eigenvalues, the joint eigenvalues are just the pairwise sums of the individual eigenvalues. So as an example, if I had, um, so now I can draw, let me draw an example here, which will make things clear. Imagine that HA was of this form. We just have two qubits. So we have this with EA, and I really keep the distances here. And HB was of this form, TB. And I took the tensor product of this system. What it would give me is this, 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 and that. This is zero, zero, AB. Now, this is very important. The lower energy is EB. So this is zero, one, AB. So A is in the state zero, one is in the state B. This is one, zero, AB. And this is one, one, AB. And this is EB. This is EA. And so we also see that the, the total from 0, 0 to 1, 1 is going to be EA plus EB. Okay. So this is the manner in which we can take the tensor product of two systems and we take the individual energy structure and we get the final energy structure. It's just take the product of each of the states and the energy level is going to be the sum of the two individual energy levels. Okay. So returning to our Yes, to our question, we wanted to look at um, composing virtual qubits. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, in this state of, um, in these HA and HP, which are rather general, I'm going to pick particular states. So I'm going to pick a virtual qubit. So let's pick this virtual qubit here. And let's pick this virtual qubit here. Let's call this state I and state J. Let's call this um, state K and state L on B. And I'm going to look now at the four level system that I get from, from just this. So the first thing to say is that I pick all of them with different energies. So I, I have that EI on A is less than EJ on A. EK on B is less than E. L on B. I can always do this without loss of generality because if not, I switch the labels. And I'm also going to make um, the gap. So E. Here, which is, which I call Delta EA. So this is Delta EA. I'm going to make um, greater than the other energy gap on B. So this KB, delta EB, delta EA, greater than delta EB. Again, I can always do this. If this was not the case, and I can just switch the label A, I put it on B and put the label of B on A, and then I will have it. Um, and yeah, I pick, pick it so that they don't have the same equal energy gap. And so if I do this, then my energy level structure ends up being the following. So now I'm not going to draw the entire structure of the system, but just focus on the four dimensional subspace that has been made by taking these two virtual qubits and looking in the global, the joint state for them. And it's going to look something like this, which is exactly the same as, as I just drew down below here. This is the state EIA tensor EKB. This is the state EIA tensor ELB. This is the state E J A tensor E K B, and this is a state E J A tensor E L B. Um, right, and this is delta E B. This is delta E A, and the global thing is delta E A plus E B. So in fact, what I'm going to do is, this is useful to us. So I'm going to take it with us. 
Okay, I'm going to bring it down here. Um, right. So now this, this is our subspace, oops, sorry. This is a subspace of the whole Hilbert space of AB that we're looking at. But now imagine that my, um, my systems, my states rho A that I started with was block diagonal with respect to the IJ subspace. And the same way rho B was block diagonal with respect to the KL subspace. So I could pick those virtual qubits out. This together is going to imply that this IJKL is subspace um, is also, so rho AB, which is rho A tensor rho B is going to be block diagonal with respect to the IJ subspace as well. Um, right, so within the subspace, now what I'm going to do here is actually because typing all, writing all of these out will be irritating. So in fact, I'm going to call these 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, uh, because that will be much more convenient. And now I can write down the populations in the subspace. So, um, sorry, trying to be a bit slower here. Yes, so if we take the density matrix um, of A and the density matrix of B, and we write it down in the energy eigenbasis, then we know the property of a tensor product. What happens to the diagonal elements? They are simply the product of the diagonal elements of the individual matrices. So if I look at, let's say, the population associated to the state E A I tensor E B J, this is going to be the population associated with E A I times the population associated with E B. Oh, this is this not should not have been J. EBK. Right. So therefore, this one is now equal to, I will call this, I can call this PIA, and I can just call this PKB. This is just notation. I'm not actually assigning any values to them. Okay. Uh, are there any questions so far? Just in case I have run too quickly with this composition procedure. None? Ah, why can we multiply the populations like that? Yes. Um, right, so, okay. It's worth doing this in, in, in detail. So I know that I can write rho A in terms of the energy eigenstates of A. Um, let's call it say rho A MN E M A E N A over M N and then row B, let's say sum over, let's write it KL, row B, KL, E K B, E L B. Um, right, so now if I ask, and, and the, the diagonal elements here, so the row N N, I, I call these P N by definition, the row K K, I call these by definition PK. So now what I want to say is in row AB, which is going to be, uh, well, it's going to be the sum over M N K L, row A M N, row B K L. And now this is just, this what I'm writing is just a property of the tensor product. The, the representation in matrices of the tensor product of two states is just the, the direct product, the out, of the two, not the direct product, as in not the multiplication, but the outer product of the two matrices itself. So we get uh, E M A E K B with E N A E L B. And now I ask, what are the diagonal elements of these? So what are row. So the diagonal elements of these are where the index of the row, and so this is, these now refer to the rows, 
and these now refer to the columns in the density matrix of the joint state. And the so the, the diagonal elements are going to be where the row and the column is the same. So this is now M and K is the same as N and L. So these are the states rho M, uh, M. So M is equal to N and K is equal to L. Oh, sorry, rho M, M. Uh, sorry, rho M, M, well, let me take it. Let me take it this way. Row A, B, M, M, L, or K, K, which is exactly as we just look from, this is now row A, B, M, N, K, L. And this we see just by inspection is, is basically row A, M, M, row B, K, K, which is the product of our populations P, M, P, K on A and B. So just by the properties of the outer product of two matrices, uh, the, the tensor product of two matrices, the diagonal elements of the tensor product are the pairwise products of the diagonal elements of the original one. Does this answer the question? I hope so. Okay. Uh, I don't think I'm going to actually be able to do the entirety of the composition of virtual qubits, which I wanted to do. But so, okay, so what I'm going to conclude then now by saying is the following. So now that we have a way to compose the two density matrices and find the joint state, and we have a way to look at what two virtual qubits, individual virtual qubits in each of the systems result in, in the joint state of the system, which is, this, um, which is a four dimensional subspace, we can now look at the virtual qubits in this new subspace. And there are six such virtual qubits. So they are now, six virtual qubits we can look at, which is, we can look at the virtual qubit between, let's pick different colors, between these two states. We can look at the virtual qubit between these two states. We can also look at the virtual qubit between these two states and these two states. And finally, we can look at the virtual qubit between the intermediate states and the virtual qubit between the top and the bottom state. So there are four levels and there are six ways of taking pairs of these levels. And each of those ways of doing so isolates a virtual qubit subspace. And the goal for us now is to understand, well, if I know the properties of my original virtual qubits, then what are the properties of the final virtual qubits um, that I see in this subspace going to be? And effectively, I will, I will not um, I will not go into this this time because we're running out of time. But what we want to find out is, what we will find out rather, is that the levels that I've marked in blue are essentially the virtual qubits corresponding to the state of B remaining the same and the state of A changing. So they very much have the same properties as the original virtual qubit from A. The ones that I marked in green are essentially formed by the state of a remaining the same, but B changing. So you can see that here, which is which will look like the same properties as the virtual qubit on B. So the only two virtual qubits of interest are the ones that are marked in orange and in green, because those are the states for both A and B change. But one of them has a property that the virtual temperature we get is always in between the temperature that, um, that we started off with. Whereas the other one has a property that the virtual temperature is in fact always outside the range of the temperatures that we started with, which is essentially where all of the magic of thermal machines happens, because this is the manner in which we use two temperatures to generate a temperature that is colder than both of them or hotter than both of them, depending on what we, what we wish to do. Um, and so that is where we will continue at the beginning of the next lecture. Um, and yeah, if there are any more questions now, the lecture notes, I will say actually already have the current version of the lecture notes have much more than what I've talked about in this lecture. They also have the composition of virtual qubits, which you are free to read in, in, well, in preparation or just to see how it goes or try it out on your own before the next lecture. But I will explain um, how to do this in, in detail when I begin the next lecture. Are there any final questions to conclude? Regarding um, the virtual temperature. Yes. 
for example, you said that if we compose these um, two ther thermal states with different temperature, um, we can possibly find um, qubit subspaces with a higher virtual temperature um, than we started with. Is this virtual temperature, say, it's somehow um, operationally accessible? So that yes. We virtual temperature, or do we need many more steps to um, yes, uh, yes, this. Indeed, this is a good question. Um, and the answer is, is yes. So imagine the following, I have a qubit system, and this is exactly what we'll do in a later lecture, but imagine that I have a qubit system that I want to make either very cold or I want to make very hot. So I have to make a refrigerator or a heat pump. Then what I do is I take two other systems that can be any dimension. I take the tensor product of them and I pick a qubit subspace inside that tensor product, which is exactly what we're trying to do here, that has the desired temperature that I'm trying to create on my system qubit. And then, then the only thing that remains is to connect these two subspaces together. And this we will discuss how to make these two interact in a manner that essentially makes the virtual qubit of one of them sort of transmitted, sort of the virtual temperature of one of them become the virtual temperature of the other one. But, but the answer is yes, this is exactly the point of designing these qubit subspaces so that we can then connect them via unitary operations or interaction Hamiltonians to systems that we want to do something upon. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Maybe um, regarding the um, your notion of subspace or qubit subspace, for example, yes. if we um, um, compose three qubits, then yes. we have um, two times two times two, which equals eight dimensions. Indeed. So we'd be able to find four qubit subspaces there using- Well, well more than that, eight. So eight choose two, so eight, like 28 subspaces. Oh, yes. okay. Yeah, indeed. Okay, so in that sense, we really look for two dimensional subspaces, but it's not um, a factoring of our Hilbert space into um, a qubit and yeah, whatever remains. So it's- Ah, uh, no, no, indeed not, indeed not, no. So the qubit subspaces that we pick in the joint state will not have the property that we can, not generally have the property that we can then factor with respect to this. Or even if, even if we pick it in such a manner that we can factor it, this factorization will be very strange because it will not respect the locality of the different subsystems that we brought together to make the joint system. Okay, yes, that makes sense. Well, yeah, this notion of um, subspaces and composing systems um, mm -hmm. be treated in more detail later in the lecture. Um, or do we see examples of? Um, yes, so I will, I will definitely do examples. And uh, so I will, and the tutorial uh, that we designed will also have examples to do this. Um, if, yes, yeah, so I, I think with the examples that we do, it should become clear as to what happens So we'll have, we will actually take density matrices and find what the joint state is. If it is the case that after, let's say the next tutorial and the next lecture, it's still not very clear, then, then perhaps at the beginning of the next lecture or the end, sometime in the next lecture, I can go into this a bit more detail to bridge the gap for anybody who's uh, struggling with it. Yeah, I think it um, will become clear also after spending some more time with the material. Perfect. I hope so. But thanks for the question. Yes. Uh, I opened the chat. Oh, excellent. You replied that your the previous explanation was good. Um, yes. Yeah, so actually, just to conclude with that, that question, um, a very easy way, like in terms of the energy level diagrams, all I would do is I could simply add another, or let me choose a different color. So imagine I came next to this, um, this energy level structure and I simply added now a third system C, which is let's say, this is the energy level structure. And then I can describe the unitary operation that simply swaps um, these two states. Uh, and now this I will make a bit clearer. Oh, sorry.
which corresponds to the following unitary, which is swapping. Um, so it's identity on every state that on the rest of the states, but then it swaps the following states. It says, let's take the state, uh, if I call this zero and one on C, it takes the state zero on C, E, J on A, E, L on B, and it swaps it for the state one on C, E, J on A, E, K on B. And I have to add the Hermitian conjugate as well. So this takes, it essentially takes the joint state that is described by this energy level, and it switches it for the joint state described by that energy level.